Please be seated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to IHC and the valedictory address of Professor Guy Allard. Guy, may I please invite you to come on stage. My dear Mr. Rector, dear colleagues and uh, family and friends, I'm very glad and indeed very honored that you are here now attending uh, my valedictory uh, address. In the Netherlands and in Belgium, we are now again experiencing a very dry uh, spring. And uh, this graph you have certainly seen in the newspapers two days ago. This is the rainfall deficit. Uh, this is the amount of the number of millimeters of uh, uh, rain deficit over a year. The blue line is the average over the past century. That's normal. The red and the orange are extreme dry years, 1976, for example. And we are on the black line. And you see we are in uh, difficult terrain here. And the rains of today and yesterday will not change very much. And then uh, last year in July, uh, the Ardennes, Limburg, and the Eiffel were hit by uh, unparalleled floods, claiming to more than 200 deaths. And that in uh, the most rich part of the world. So, <clears throat> water is a complicated affair. Uh, we love water and we hate water. Today I will talk about this complexity across the globe which will add even more complex complexity. First, I will look at uh, how we uh, stand with water, what the status is, and what we can do about it. So by uh, good science, by capable institutions, and also by finance. Because water is complicated, we do not quite understand it. We cannot control it well. And uh, when we do something on some counts, we have success, and on others, we, don't, we do not have success. So we say that the glass is half full. Very important. So the really important question is is the glass uh, getting fuller or is it emptying? In 1986, so that's 25 years ago, I was appointed here a professor of uh, public health engineering. At that time, the International Water Supply Decade was running. It aimed to bring, by 1990, so long time ago, uh, it aimed to bring uh, drinking water and sanitation to all households. The decade was considered uh, a failure. And here you see what was achieved, so 1980 to 1990. Uh, the dark blue line is the world population from 4.5 to 5 billion. The promise was to get from here to full coverage, and in reality, only, you know, maybe three quarters was achieved. So there was a major, uh, a major uh, shortfall. I joined then a international conference, I was just appointed here, an international conference at the, <clears throat> in The Hague, where the United Nations and the donor countries debated how 
or whether to continue financial support to the global programs of water supply and sanitation because they just have proven that it was not working. It was an important event because um, <clears throat> John Carl Matter, uh, the chief um, water advisor to the World Bank, and by the way, an alumnus of IMC of 1976, so he convinced the donors that it was meritorious and useful to continue financing. You see me standing here, I didn't contribute much at that time. In the back is hiding um, Frank Hartfeld, a director at UNDP at that time. But more important was that at that event in 1988, it was the first time that Nicolette and I we met each other without us knowing that we were there together and that we had a future together. The main reasons for the shortfall were a lack of appropriate technologies, governments who did not know how to engage with communities, and weak capacity, so little knowledge, weak organizations in the countries. And indeed, I have experienced that firsthand myself when in Indonesia, uh, I, I often um, saw that, like here, you know, an Indonesian family, Japanese, Japanese family, that had destroyed its new water tap because they didn't like the, uh, uh, the new tap, they didn't like to pay for the water. So now we have, um, so now we have uh, a new program, a new global policy to bring, to try to bring again water to the households. It's now part of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, and SDG 6, number 6 out of 17, there are 17 goals. <clears throat> um, yeah, you can see what we have achieved so far. So it started somewhere in 2013, but you see that by 2020, yes, uh, on the rural households we have uh, achieved some progress. In the urban uh, houses, uh, the situation has stagnated, partly because, of course, cities have grown so fast. Uh, the population has grown from 6 to 7, 7.8 7 billion. So in total, we definitely uh, cannot uh, show great results. The figures for sanitation are even worse, a third worse. And there's no way that we can achieve the SDG by 2030, which is in eight years from now. The some are already concluding that this is again a failure, but I would argue that the glass is still half full because in the meantime, more than a billion households or people have uh, received this uh, water service. Secondly, many countries have become richer and more capable. They are better prepared for the future. And of course, finally, the objective was not very realistic. With complex challenges like this, it's essential to uh, set realistic priorities. Other, other SDGs, other goals, they want to expand food production, energy, jobs, industry, what have you. It's all good. Except they all use plenty of water, and more importantly, they do damage the hydrological cycles. This picture reflects the mindset of the water manager, and she sees the water system in the middle. It's a big system. <clears throat> um, agriculture, industry, households, are primarily consumers of water and they pollute the water. Ecosystems thrive on water, they need water, but at the same time they are the foundation, they are the basis that provides water to the water system. And then thirdly, we have as a society, we have our know-how and our organizations on how we manage and safeguard the water system. Now, unfortunately, the um, Water systems are deteriorating quite rapidly, um, so land use change is a main culprit. And ecosystems, for example, are being destroyed, so the productive economic value of ecosystems and biodiversity is being destroyed at the rate of 10 to 30 trillions of US dollars per year. So that's large, and actually this destruction now is proceeding faster than before. The rapid increase in water abstraction also <clears throat> means that we sit in a major shift now. 
So 10 years ago, one in six people were living in water short places, so 16% of the population 10 years ago. But by 2040, which is tomorrow, more than half of the world population will live in basins, river basins, or water shores. So, that, so they will have to deal with water stress. And it means that we have to change our mindset. So, so far we have always thought as, of the world as a place abundant with water, with, with here and there a few, a few deserts. But in reality, in 30 years, it will be a world that it will be structurally uh, short of water. Where water is short, um, people tend to pump groundwater, and we see one dramatic consequence of that uh, when the land is sinking. And that's happening across the world at increasing rate as well. So here in California, you see about 40 meters. The, the land has dropped because of oak pumping for irrigation. But also in the Netherlands, the bunker is sitting on his piles. But also in China, in Mexico City, uh, the Ganges Plain, so many places. When you have this sinking, in a second, uh, Consequences that it becomes more prominent for floods. So, because water flo rainwater flows to the lowest place, obviously. And so, when I was working in Jakarta <clears throat> in uh, 20 years ago for the World Bank, um, I led there a renewed effort to address the recurrent floods of Jakarta. In 2001 and 2002, I was faced with a typical uh, flood. And you see, this is a flood we all know, of course. It's, the water is brown, so this is the main avenue in Jakarta. The water is brown because of all the silt that has been flushed from the, uh, the hillsides by the rain. And uh, we have overcast rainy uh, skies. But then one day, we were starting to see this. So here we see bluish white water uh, gushing through the streets. And you see also it's, the sun is shining. So what was happening here? So here you see Jakarta, um, 12 million people in the, in the color basin on the coast with the Java Sea. And we knew that the coast, that the coast of the city had already sunk by four meters and was still sinking. In other places, two meters sinking. But <clears throat> what, what we had witnessed was that actually for the first time in the history, and so the city, or the coast at least of the city, the coastline had sunk below the maximum level of the very high pines that every few years occurs. So that was um, kind of a wake-up call, a watershed, we could say. And you see how even between 2007 and 2013, the seawall has to be heightened to keep away the the tide, but it was also a wake-up call because suddenly everybody realized that in Indonesia up to 50 million people are at risk um, to seaborne floods. Now the rising sea level, because of climate change, will make this more acute in the next century. However, climate-induced rise goes by about uh, 2 millimeters per year, whereas the uh, land subsidence caused by bad water management goes 100 times faster. And yet, many Indonesian politicians still blame climate change for what is happening here. I showed this slide before to demonstrate the interdependency. But from what I now just described, in fact, it should be like this. So water is not dominant at all. It is a very small and very vulnerable domain. And it is very dependent on what is decided and done in the other domains. So the question is, can we keep the glass half full? We need to use, indeed, our knowledge and our institutional, our government capacity to uh, improve this. To be more specific, what did I contribute? So the past 30 years, it was very challenging, but we kept the glass half full. But in the next 30 years, it will become much more challenging. So science, is one way to go forward, capable institutions, as I mentioned, and finance. Now, I must say to my astonishment, 
um, I found that I worked in water and on water already for a half a century. I apologize for that. I chose to study water treatment for my engineering dissertation in Leuven back in 1974. So that's almost uh, half a century. That proved exciting and led to a doctorate in, um, in, uh, <clears throat> on, on flocculation and treatment for drinking water. At that time, I was also um, interested in educational affairs and I was part of a small group that was working on the um, restructuring, the renewal of the engineering curriculum at our university. Life-changing life was my assignment a few years later, so between 1981 and 84, to go to Surabaya, live in Surabaya for three years and support the, the technical university there with their new department for environmental engineering. It taught me many important things and respect for different value systems. This work proved very productive. So, with a colleague, we wrote a, the first handbook in Bahasa Indonesia on uh, water treatment. We told that Pendelikian Air. Air means not air, but means water. And uh, it still is in its uh, 20th edition available in uh, bookstores in Indonesia. <laughs> Unfortunately, my engagement and my contribution to the department choir. Uh, proved more controversial, as in the same context we ended last. I don't know why. I was appointed then in 1986 here at the IHG, where Public Health Engineering Institute was at that time world famous outside of the Netherlands, but needed restructuring. Professor Stegen, the new rector, he um, asked me to convert the existing one-year diploma courses into uh, more modern uh, Master of Science programs and um, also start a PhD program. So the first three uh, Master of Science in, in Environmental Engineering were uh, delivered in uh, 1987. I was appointed vice rector together with uh, Jan Leindijk, and over subsequent years we expanded the postgraduate programs, including a lot of specialized courses for Iranian engineers, Indonesian engineers, um, Libyan engineers, uh, Eastern European engineers and scientists. We established the master's and the PhD programs. We invested heavily in computer facilities, top-notch computer facilities. <laughs> Don't laugh, this was in 1988. At that time, these were very powerful, amongst the most powerful equipment that you could buy on the market. And IHC has been, from then and until now, a leader in the world in the field of what is called hydroinformatics. We also invested heavily in the laboratories. Oh, sorry, uh, that is also, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the creation uh, technology that we set up together with our colleagues from the Technical University Delft. The expansion and the transition is shown here. So here you see uh, from 1985 down to the year 2000. The yellow line is the diploma course participation and the gray one the MSc participation, so MSc to completely over. But you see also that uh, at some point we had uh, 350 students uh, from all over the world studying here under this roof. And the professionalism was exemplary, I thought, because, as an example, um, in 1989, just after the Iraqi Iranian war in the Gulf, we had here specialized courses for Iranian and Iraqi engineers. And they would collaborate in many classes, almost all in the class of groundwater hydrology, which was taught by Jacob Beer, a Israeli professor. For the research program, we developed concepts applicable to the conditions in developing countries. So low investment, high science, and optimally using the local conditions. The first collaboration started with Suzhou 
University in China. Um, <clears throat> and out of this collaboration uh, came also a first PhD activity with uh, uh, Chao Yashin, who in um, 1994 was the first environmental doctor to graduate at the same time as we had the first hydraulic engineer graduating. And Chao, he studied uh, aerobic uh, biodegradation. He found it in canals, uh, regular natural courses. You had enough biomass and biofilm to metabolize organic pollution. With Professor Van Vierzen, we started studies on eco-technology. So our Ugandan fellows worked in uh, on the Nakivubo Swamp in Kampala, Lake Victoria. And the emergent, um, sorry, it was here. And the emergent uh, papyrus, Miscatidium, and other reefs formed floating mats with enough biomass to convert and absorb all the organic pollution and the nutrients. So these studies demonstrate the viability of cost effective nature based solutions, green infrastructure, as it's called. And that is now mainstream uh, in the water uh, management literature. Similar studies by uh, Al Mazaidi on ponds in Yemen covered with duckweed. Uh, here in Bangladesh, the duckweed is then harvested and fed to fish, and you see uh, a healthy catch is uh, collected. Al Hamdi, uh, Al Abu Madi from Yemen, Palestine, and other countries worked on the valuation allocation of water between different uses from wastewater recycling in Yemen, Palestine, Jordan, North Africa, and a few more. It's not always easy going. Um, here in Bangladesh, I was crossing this bamboo bridge, which you don't find, don't laugh, because the next one, my colleague from Wageningen, Mark Verrecke, he did fall in the water. But here in Yemen, a year later, um, returning from Rada, uh, from Rada um, uh, project, we were uh, held up by Kalashnikovs, by a tribe that wanted to carjack our car. I dove into a dish filled with thistles, only in a few minutes to be woken up, so to speak, by the bullets, also shot by the villagers behind me, who then made sure that the Hijackers, the carjackers uh, were uh, fleeing, but uh, in the end, luckily nobody got hurt. Duckweed-based lagooning, wastewater reuse, filtration, have remained important research topics in uh, this institute. And then in 1996, I uh, became a staff member of the World Bank in Washington, D.C., but retained a relationship with IMC. And some colleagues thought that I had surrendered my research inclination by doing so. But the World Bank actually is equally a uh, research organization, it's a knowledge organization, and it invests only in development programs that are innovative, not the leading ones. And this also made me shift from water supply and wastewater to the broader water resources, irrigation, basin management. And for example, I designed the Mekong strategy in East Asia. In Central Asia, parts of the Sirdaria and IRC programs in, in the Balkans, Sava, Drina, and Redva programs. In Poland, I led a program um, to ensure flood protection on the Odra, uh, the Odra in Polish, and the Vistula, um, Vistula in Polish, so which together cover half of the country. Uh, the Odra runs from Szczecin via Wrocław to um, the Czech Republic, 900 kilometers long, and it had suffered in 97 massive floods, 55 people killed. So this overall program was uh, about two and a half billion euros, which um, makes it indeed a large program, comparable to the Dutch Room for the River program on the Rhine and the ISO. The innovative aspects included optimization of the menu of dikes, dredging, ecological overflow areas, reservoirs, land use, but also the amicable relocation of villages and the rejuvenation of the cultural assets of the city of Wroclaw. The larger challenge, however, was to make about 200 ministries, agencies, 
provinces, municipalities, water boards, and what have you, to collaborate effectively on this program. So that um, built on my interest in organizational management and how knowledge and capacity of water organizations can be strengthened. In the beginning, you remember half an hour ago, I described how the glass was half empty in 1990, after the water decade. And um, with Frank Hartfeld, who is, has now joined us <laughs> uh, at UNDP, and with our colleagues uh, uh, in IHG, so Wim Sabenaye, Paul van Hofwege, um, Adam Graham Sundersing, uh, <coughs> and our UN colleagues, we uh, launched a new initiative, namely a symposium and a platform to study how the right type of knowledge and capacity can be developed in governance and through education. So this um, led to um, this book, the Strategy for Water Stable Capacity Building. An important tenet was cultural sensitivity. Very important. And that's also what we as organizers did do, uh, being culturally sensitive to the Dutch situation. And mind you, I still have my clothes. <laughs> Maybe I can get them in the garden. <laughs> this led to a series of six international symposiums every four or five years. Um, <clears throat> and the last one was in 2020, just uh, uh, around the corner, a virtual event, of which the proceedings are being printed as we speak. Capacity development has since become the central pillar of IHC's educational programs. It also spawned dedicated research, and my two last research fellows studied how knowledge travels through society and through governments and how it strengthens them. And you did Kasper Sma, um, did so for Indonesia's Ministry of Public Works and Water Management, and Silas Mukuri Hernande did the same on African water utilities. Water management in the world is still too much a bureaucratic affair. Water organizations will become more flexible, use adaptive approaches to today start with the investments that will protect us in 30 years from now. <clears throat> to have successful water management, oh yeah, no, I found this um, <laughs> in my papers, and this is a page from Kasper Smaas uh, PhD. Yeah. So, you know, in retrospect, <laughs> looking at it, I think, you know, when she received that by email at 10 in the evening, I, I wonder if she had enough patience to read all my comments and uh, advice and uh, suggestions and uh, criticisms. <laughs> but to have a successful um, uh, water management, effective water management, we need also finance. <clears throat> so we need to engage private capital for this, because between now and 2050, when all this stuff needs to be done, needs to be ready, major capital is needed because we need to still provide basic water supply and sanitation services. We have to adapt to the climate, the climate change, flood protection, drought management, and we also have in this country, in Belgium, to replace uh, old infrastructure. So far, developing countries have been meeting these needs by perhaps 25-30% only, so it's a big gap. Also, the rich countries, on average, have been um, meeting only three quarters of the required investment. Public budgets, of course, will um, remain important, but increasingly prove insufficient because also there are other demands that need to be met, such as uh, health, education, um, and so on. At this moment, on average, only 30% of the financing needs in the developed countries are covered. So we have a major um, challenge ahead of us. So we need to bring in with the public also the private capital. And the good news is that actually there is a lot of private capital available and increasingly interested. So here we see a comparison. Here's the population, the global population, billions, the GDP, the financial capital, you know, available slushing around in the capital markets, 1990 and then now. And you see that the world population has grown by 
the economic um, wealth of the world has grown by 250%, but the financial uh, resources have grown by almost close to 400%. So there's a lot of money that is available for this purpose. Yeah, I'll let you study this thing uh, now. <clears throat> so we can draw in uh, private capital. The good news, uh, sorry, uh, but we have to still, of course, be careful to avoid monopolistic and exploitative uh, arrangements. But we have at our disposal now, oh, these are, yeah, we have at our disposal now several instruments. Uh, blended finance is one instrument that is being worked on, but also green and climate bonds and green funds are becoming available. And uh, intermediary institutions, these are institutional organizations that operate between the water sector and the financial sector and that help to get matches. For example, the Netherlands Water Bank is a very good example of this, very active. In Flanders, Flanders we have a very uh, effective aquafin. In the US we have the US EPA that fulfills such a function. And recently in Kenya, the Kenya um, uh, Water Facility, in China the Shantong uh, Green Development Fund and, and others. There are very, uh, there is a whole array of specialized uh, uh, vehicles for that. Now, these uh, intermediary institutions will become more important in the developing uh, context. Substantial research is required on the water management side to, you know, to make sure that the match can be made. And in my view, this is an important area where IG can contribute. And if you want to know more, this book is published this week, in which I work with colleagues from the OECD on this uh, conundrum. So, in conclusion, the glass has stayed half full so far. The decades that come will bring, without doubt, uh, many more pressures. We should not be naive about that. The real question then is whether we can avoid the glass getting emptier in this country and in the more vulnerable places in the world. And to ensure that we need to combine <clears throat> our know-how and capacity with political will. Most of what I narrated um, is the result of teamwork and not a lonesome initiative. And I'm very grateful for the exciting opportunities this institute has offered me and the many professional and personal friendships uh, it has brought. If anything, this institute will keep having to play a very important role and an even larger one than till now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. I would now like to invite Dr. Judith Kastrosma to come to stage. Good afternoon, everyone, dear Guy, dear Nicolette, and uh, family and friends. Uh, my name is Judith Kastersma, and you all know that by now I work at Beltanis uh, as a department head in flood risk management. Um, and I owe that also partly to, uh, to my professor Guy. <laughs> uh, back in 2008, uh, Guy was looking for a PhD student for uh, the new, uh, at that time, new DUPC uh, program on knowledge and capacity development. Uh, and we started talking. Well, that's not a good idea. <laughs> we started talking, and after giving it uh, careful thought, I decided that Guy's proposal was exactly the topic and the depth of knowledge that I was looking for. And so a big and also slightly scary adventure, at least for me, <laughs> not because of you, uh, started uh, for us. 
And one of the reasons why I was so convinced that this was a good decision was Guy's uh, incredible drive and passion for this topic. And that's very uh, contagious. During my studies, uh, Guy was very much involved, as you could see from the text that I got back. <laughs> And he truly cared about my research project, and that's really special, because I also know other uh, promovendi, promovendi who, who have different experiences, so I was really lucky with that. And needless to say, I'm delighted and also a bit humbled to say a few words this afternoon. Guy, um, I have very fond memories of our work together in Delft, and our trips to the OECD and to UNESCO in Paris. I remember one trip that we took that you had a broken arm, I think, and that someone pushed you also in the, in the subway, and it really <laughs> hurt you, and I had to put up your jacket because you couldn't <laughs> pull up the zipper yourself, so it was quite interesting. <laughs> um, and also uh, our time in Indonesia together and the field trip with your World Bank uh, colleagues and the, and the many discussions that we had on our trip. It was a very steep uh, learning curve for me, and, and that's for sure. Um, you have a way of giving feedback in a very gentle and kind manner, and you are way too friendly to be strict, even though uh, you could have been stricter with me and my deadlines, I think. <laughs> um, and then also one day, we actually took a day off, which was also quite yeah. special. And we went sailing with your wooden boat. <laughs> and it was a great afternoon with, with great food and drinks. I mean, uh, leave that to the Flemish people. Uh, and good wind. And you said, Judith, never buy a wooden boat. Well, <laughs> you know what happened. <laughs> All my spare weekends I'm now working on my wooden boat. <laughs> um, be a, a bit on a more serious note, in the time we worked together, you, you showed me uh, three important points. Uh, one is, and I already mentioned it, you have a never-ending drive to put knowledge and capacity building on the agenda, time and time again. You also prove it uh, today. Um, because it's so important and will always be important. Achieving the, the SDGs, uh, adaptation to climate change, uh, the list goes on. Knowledge and capacity to do that is at the basis. And I'm impressed and humbled by that and inspired, and it, it teaches me the importance of focus. Uh, and the second is your capability to create such a clear storyline, also today, in your work, and, and also use knowledge from other fields. Like you always came to me with um, quotes from philosophy and interesting articles, but also very current news items. That, that show the, the relevance of our work. And the third is that achieving genius is hard work. And you said it many times to me in Dutch. You did. There is 1% inspiratie and 99% transpiratie. <laughs> so 1% inspiration and 90% perspiration. And so sweat and tears. And yes, there were also some tears in getting it done. <laughs> Uh, this profession that you gave your heart to will stay very relevant, and the job will never be done. It will stay complex, and it's a glass half full, like you called it uh, today. We will uh, really miss you, but I think you gave many people the tools and the, and the spirit to continue this, uh, this important work. You will go off sailing a lot, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> but I hope uh, we will connect, uh, stay connected, because we, uh, we do need your advice on this topic. So I would like to wish you a great start of a new chapter in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very nice words. I would now like to invite Dr. Bishwa Patakshagia. Maybe come to this microphone. Okay, yes. thank you. you. No, that's okay, that's okay. Professor Guy Allers, professors, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I thought my voice is too loud, maybe that's why I'm moving. Yeah, it's okay? Well, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to talk in this occasion. I'll be talking on behalf of our department 
Guy and I have been working in the same department for quite some time. I see that Ian Lowendijk, suddenly I didn't know that you were here. So Ian hired me in our former department called Hydroelectronics and Knowledge Management. We used to call it HICM. And since then, we were associated in HICM, and for that, we moved to then to the new department where we marched with water management and water governance. And that time, actually, we were sitting next to each other, and Judith was sitting opposite us for some time. And then we moved again and formed a new department, which is called, again, a difficult name. We always speak of difficult names for departments, hydroelectronics uh, and socio-technical innovation, HISTI. The easy name is HISTI. Now, we have, unfortunately, I have not been, work, I have not worked with Guy on any project, but who knows? Maybe <laughs> when you are not sailing or repairing your wooden boats, maybe in the future we'll be working together. <laughs> and when I talk to water professionals across the world, uh, and some of them were also today visiting Aichi. And it gives me the impression uh, that how well known Aichi is for uh, every corner of the world. And uh, it's quite widely recognized as a global center for water knowledge. That gives me enormous pride as well. Some of the people, many, many people who have contributed to building this image and I have to say, Guy, you are one of them, so we are very thankful to you and proud of you for building this image for IHE. It's not an easy task for contributing to solving global water challenges for more than 30 years. I thought 30 years, but you said almost 50 years, so it's much more than what I thought, actually. <clears throat> but you are becoming, our, or you have become our emeritus professor, so uh, we are not leaving you, or you are not leaving us, so... Once again, if you're not sailing, we can, uh, we can actually use your immense knowledge and wisdom in our work. And I hope these opportunities will be coming in the days and maybe I will also be fortunate to work with you. And then I think that uh, this last about 50 years, you have been working, you have been busy with your karma. You know, I'm from India, that's why I'm raising this karma. So you've been busy with your karma, so we can perhaps call you as a karma yogi. <laughs> if you know the word yogi, who is actually practicing yoga, not the exercise, the real yoga. So he's a yogi, and you perhaps can be a karma yogi, but in a true sense, in the ancient philosophy is that a yogi wouldn't be waiting for rewards, or would not be accepting rewards, which is not really true in modern world. But now you are an emeritus professor, so our relationship with you are not bounded by this give and take principles. So probably, probably we can, you can become a true karma yogi and we can benefit from your karma in the coming years. I wish you and your family all the very best in the coming years. Thank you very much. I now invite Director of IHE, Professor Eddie Morse. Thank you. Thank you, Anik. I'm, I'm just seeing if the size of the wooden shoes fit my feet, because uh, my background is for Magelingen, and I must say I've been doing a lot of field uh, work uh, with wooden shoes, and uh, I can tell you they are quite comfortable. So, Guy, Looking at your wooden shoes, you have not been using them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I would like uh, to, and, and uh, I was asked actually to, to thank Guy for what he has done for the Institute. I think uh, Bisha already did a, a very nice, uh, say, uh, first starter there. But um, I only uh, uh, know Guy now for almost five years. And uh, I think in that time, I also did no project together with Guy, but I did a lot of other things together with him. And uh, I think what, what um, Judith was saying, and uh, which uh, I think you also picked up from uh, Guy's uh, presentation and way of presenting, it's quite nice and fun to do something together with, uh, with Guy. 
And I, I remember you re were referring to the last uh, conference uh, that you organized. Uh, uh, you wrote a paper together with Judith, uh, by the way, I think. And um, I think that that was about capacity development. And I think with that, uh, it also uh, shows a little bit uh, the overarching umbrella uh, of uh, what, what uh, IG is interested in, is how can we develop capacity in uh, the world. But also, I think the very broad approach that, that Guy has in there. And uh, I, I would recommend uh, to you, if you're interested in that, please read uh, the paper from uh, Guy and, and Judith, because it's quite interesting. Also tell us a little bit um, about what uh, has happened in Indonesia and, and his uh, knowledge in there. Uh, but I, what I also very much appreciated in there is that uh, what uh, they also do is that they uh, connect that uh, also with the economic side of it. And uh, I don't know if um, uh, you, you have been engaged in, in uh, negotiations like that, but often when you start to uh, want to push something, you talk about euros or dollars in the end, because uh, that's where uh, a lot of the decision makers in the end also would like to know what is it costing, us, what is the price, and of course we should then tell them what the benefits are. So I think that's that's a very very helpful approach. And with Guy's background in uh, the World Bank, he was also an asset to uh, the Institute IG because he was uh, recognized also from the outside of somebody who could speak on behalf of both worlds the world of water, but also the world of finance. And I think that's uh, still a very important issue. So uh, I must say, I, I would like to join Vishwa in saying that uh, maybe the Emeritus uh, part uh, we should really cherish and uh, ask you to engage with us and uh, um, be there uh, for the time to come. Because I think with the UN Water Conference that will uh, take place next year in New York, first time in 40 years, so it's something you can't miss, Guy. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, also in, in that conference, uh, these issues will again uh, be on the table. So I would uh, very much appreciate uh, your, your input um, and help uh, for uh, making sure that also that uh, will become a success. And I know that uh, on and in this conference, the issues that Guy just showed here in the slide, so what commitments are there? How well are we able to also fulfill these commitments and are we able to achieve the sustainable development goals are again on, on the table. And so I think lessons learned from the past are very, very welcome to show us the way forward. I think, uh, Guy, that uh, I've now been talking a little bit about IG, but uh, I know that besides a wooden boat, uh, there's another uh, great hobby and I know that uh, Guy has more. Uh, the other one is, is Rotary. And uh, I think that uh, Guy, uh, in, in his uh, connections also with other uh, Rotary members uh, throughout the world, he also managed actually uh, to assure in, in a very gentle and soft way that uh, there was a lot of support from the Rotary and that uh, I think we're now about 120 or 130 fellowships. Uh, is that correct, Buzz? 150. 150. Here, there we go. So 150 fellowships uh, from Rotary, and I think that uh, also there, uh, Guy, you played a very nice role in uh, connecting um, IG uh, with, uh, with the Rotary. So also thanks for that. And I think, and there I would like uh, to stop, but there's one other person here in the room that I would like to thank, and that's that we were allowed to borrow you for a part of uh, the time of, of the every day, and that's Nicolette. So uh, Nicolette, uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of all my colleagues and we have a, a very small token. It's of course wet because we are a water institute. <laughs> but uh, Nicolette, uh, may I give uh, this to you? Um, as sort of a uh, symbolic um, say exchange for the time that we've been going on. Now we're giving you the flowers, but we're also slowly handing him back to you. I hope uh, that you will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we do that uh, because otherwise the shock is going to be too. So uh, <laughs> you will uh, allow us to uh, borrow B uh, still for uh, some. some Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite you all uh, also for a reception uh, downstairs, and uh, I hope that we'll also uh, give you the opportunity 
uh, not only congratulate Geek, but I would be quite interested to hear also the stories from you on how you met me. So I'm looking also forward to, uh, to that reception. Thank you very much. Would you please rise? <laughs> Nicolette, can I? Yeah. Yes. Mag ik? Ja. Interesting. Thank you. 